Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? The iPod line has finally been officially discontinued by Apple, but that doesn't mean there's no longer any interest in these players. This time, let's take a look at the iPod family and I'll offer some suggestions as to specific models to look for if this is a platform you're interested in getting into. This is a video I've been planning on doing for a while, but with Apple discontinuing the final iPod in the lineup, the iPod Touch in May 2022, well, I think there's gonna be a lot of renewed interest in the iPod ecosystem in general, especially from people who either never got into it to begin with back when they were all new, or people who had one back then and kind of miss it and want to re-experience them again. I mean, this platform is, after all, 20 years old, so some of these are definitely in the retro category. I'm not going to be covering the iPod Touch with this. I'm only going to cover kind of classic iPods, basically ones that really, for the most part, only play music. The iPod Touch is, in general, just an iPhone without the phone. It's, in some ways, a very different device than these. And I think talking about the iPod Touch and just older iPhones and vintage iOS gaming, yes, that is a thing, that would be best served by a completely separate episode. So this time, we're only going to cover the iPod family that basically was designed just for playing music. Now, it all started, of course, with the original iPod from 2001. This thing was incredible when it was brand new, at least compared to what a lot of the competition was doing. The whole concept of portable MP3 players was still fairly new. Yes, there were other companies that produced MP3 players prior to Apple getting involved in that market, but the iPod was one that really kind of brought a lot of different components together into an easy to use platform. It was also at a time when Apple was getting renewed recognition, the iMac was fairly new, and the company had been brought back kind of from the brink. So the iPod was really kind of the second thing that helped cement Apple's status as not just a trendy company, but one that could produce desirable products. Prior to it, like in the mid 90s, Apple was in really rough shape, so the iPod really kind of signified that Apple was back. Initially, these only worked with Macs, and there was a couple of reasons for that. First, of course, is because they only synced with iTunes. You needed to use Apple's software to put music on this thing. You couldn't just drag and drop onto this thing like it was an external hard drive or anything. You needed to use iTunes to synchronize files. And initially, at least, that was only available on the Macintosh. The other reason is because PCs at the time, well, not all of them had this interface. This is FireWire 400. Apple went with FireWire on the original iPod for a couple of reasons. On the Mac, FireWire was kind of the default interface around 2001. Apple had been shipping computers with FireWire for at least a couple of years at that point, and so it was a safe bet for them to go with. The other reason was actually technical. Firewire was way faster than what USB was capable of at the time. USB 1.1 topped out at 12 megabits per second, whereas Firewire 400, kind of according to its name, could do 400 megabits. So it basically meant you could synchronize music onto your iPod way faster than if you were to just do it over USB. Later versions of the iPod, specifically this second gen, functionally very similar to the first one. They're also almost identical cosmetically. The big difference is the first gen iPod has a mechanical scroll wheel. This thing physically spins, whereas the second gen, it's touch sensitive, and this is the beginning of Apple getting into touch sensitive controls on the iPod. The other thing is there's a couple of like minor changes on the top, and here's the other way that you can kind of tell them apart. The first gen, the FireWire port is always exposed. The second gen, it's behind a little rubber flap just to keep it clean. They also slightly redesign like the top panel here a bit. Otherwise, they work the same. 
work. The first gen iPods came in five and 10 gigabyte capacities, whereas the second gens came in 10 and 20 gigabytes. The second gen is where Apple officially included support for Windows. Some people erroneously believe that these first gen iPods are not compatible with Windows at all. Like for some reason they thought you can only ever use these on a Mac, that is not true. While initially you could only use them on a Mac just because that's the only software compatibility they had, you could later on, after the Windows versions of iTunes came about, actually reformat these for the Windows file system. So if you pick up one of these early first gen iPods, don't worry, you can use it with basically whatever platform you want. You may just have to reformat it in the process. In 2003, Apple completely redesigned the look of the iPod. All new enclosure and also an all new control sequence. This thing is all touch controls. There's no physical buttons on it except for the sliding hold switch on the top. This unit actually also brought a number of different capacities to it as well. It wasn't just, you know, the 10 and 20 gig kind of options like the second gen. You could get these and I believe 10, 15, 20, 30 and 40 gigabyte capacities over its lifetime. What's interesting though, and what's also very limiting on the third gens is the interface options. You can use these with USB. These were the very first iPods to support synchronizing data over USB. However, you can't charge them over USB. You still have to use FireWire for that. So you could get a FireWire to dock connector cable and the dock connector was brand new with the third gen. Yep, this is where the dock connector all started and do everything over one cable if you've got the FireWire version and a FireWire port on your computer. Otherwise, if all you had was USB, like you had a Windows PC and no FireWire built in and no desire to add a FireWire card, you had two options. One is you could get a 30 pin to USB cable and use that just for synchronizing. The caveat being you better hope the battery in the iPod has enough juice left to finish the synchronizing process because it can't charge over USB. Or you could get this really wonky cable that I used to have one of and I can't find anymore where it was actually two cables in one. There were two sets of cables that broke out from the 30 pin connector. You could plug the firewire end into like one of the charging bricks and then the USB into your computer so you could charge and sync the iPod at the same time. I really like the third gens primarily because this was actually my first iPod. Um, I bought one of these back in, I'd like to say 2004 or so. I picked up a refurbished one and I just, that's what really got me to fall in love with the iPod as a platform. Prior to that, I was using CD players and portable MP3 CD players. I did an episode all about portable CD players earlier, but the iPod by that point had just become too compelling. I could store so many more songs onto a much smaller device. I had a little bit more money to spend, so I figured, you know, I might as well go for it. And so the third gen for me, it's, it kind of holds a special place for me, but from a practical perspective, it's hard to recommend one of these these days. All right, the fourth gen from 2004, and this is where the iPod really started to get some mass market appeal. And that's partially because this is also the first iPod where Apple really kind of got its act together in terms of making it easy for anyone who had a computer to buy and use one of these. This iPod supported charging and synchronizing over USB. So suddenly you don't have to worry about any of the weird cable shenanigans or anything like that. It's got a slightly different design, still has like the chromed back, but it also brought with it the click wheel. This wasn't the first instance of the click wheel. We'll talk about that iPod in a second, but it also brought the click wheel. So suddenly now you're able to do everything kind of in one interface without separate buttons to have to move around. Otherwise, functionally, it's still really the same as all the iPods that came before. It basically just plays music. It's got like a few like minor things built in, clock and contacts and calendars and all this kind of stuff. There's a couple of built-in games like Breakout and stuff. But otherwise, this was really just meant to be a music playing device. 
There was a subsequent kind of revision or split in the product line from the fourth gen. It looks just like it, but it basically added a color screen. So they called these the iPod Color, the iPod Photo. It's very similar to the fourth gen. It's basically the same internals, just with a different screen. The only thing that they added was the ability to basically view photos on here. So, you know, we're starting to see a little bit more multifunction capability out of the iPod. How many people actually used these for showing photo slideshows? I'm not sure you could buy a dock to stick one of these in that had like an S video output and hook it up to your TV so you could like show the, the photo slideshows on your TV. Again, I don't know how many people actually did that. I suspect the people who bought the color iPods bought them just because they had a color screen and that was it. Otherwise, they're functionally the same as the fourth gens. They look pretty much the same from the outside, also available in a variety of capacities. Now, as popular as the fourth gen was, there still was another market segment that either couldn't afford or justify buying one of these. And I think a lot of those people were just ones that looked at the capacities of some of these, like 20 gigabytes, 10 gigabytes, 15 gigabytes, and just realized, you know, I'm never going to fill that. Why would I buy a device that I'm never going to fill, you know, at a higher price? And with the popularity of the iPod, of course, Apple wanted to try and hit all market segments if they could. So they released another model in a completely new form factor. This is the iPod mini. These originally came in only four gigabyte capacities, but there was a second generation that also offered a six gigabyte option. And this was really meant to be kind of the lower cost iPod. Functionally, there was really no difference between the fourth gen and the iPod mini, right? These played all the same audio files. You could synchronize them with iTunes on a Mac or a PC. They charged over USB and synchronized over the dock connector. A lot of the same accessories worked between them. These simply offered a lower price and smaller capacities to match. These were actually the very initial release for the click wheel. These came at the very tail end, I believe, of the third gen iPods life cycle right before the fourth gen arrived. Otherwise, these were incredibly popular. Lots and lots of these were sold at the time simply because they were far less expensive. I'd like to say, depending on the capacity that you went, they could be anywhere between 50 and 100 bucks or more cheaper than a fourth gen. The downside with the iPod mini is this was also one of the first iPods that became a lot more difficult to take apart because the outer casing is all one piece, one piece of aluminum. So glue is involved like with these plastic panels on the top and bottom to try and take the guts out in case you need to replace the hard drive or the battery and the hard drive we'll talk about. It's kind of hard to recommend an iPod mini if you want to get into the classic iPod scene just because they're harder to work on. You can get parts for them, but unless you're especially handy or have some sort of affinity for this form factor specifically, I I'm not sure this would be my first choice. The next iPod Apple introduced was actually maybe one of the most compelling. This is the fifth gen iPod, also called the iPod Video. And well, it's because it can play video files. Apple had at that point in time expanded the iTunes music store to also include TV and movie purchases. So this just kind of tied into that ecosystem even better. The whole idea was now it's more than just a music player. You can have all of your entertainment on the go. Of course, it still charges and synchronizes over USB, although you cannot synchronize these with Firewire. I think the fourth gen was the cutoff for that, if I'm remembering correctly. Otherwise, a very good experience. These came both in black and white, whereas prior iPods, most of them only came in white. The iPod minis came in a, a variety of pastel colors. These, I have another like particular affinity to. Um, after upgrading from my third gen because I wanted more capacity, I wanted that larger hard drive, I wanted to actually keep my entire music collection with me. I bought this 80 gig unit. 
and this one served me well for a very long time. I didn't get too much into the whole video aspect of this, but as a music listening device, that large capacity was just super compelling. And this model, I think, is where we really start to kind of see a split in terms of who bought what for what purpose. These were popular, but arguably less popular than some other models in the line. And I think that's partly due to price and also physical size. I mean, these stay fairly large, but as we'll see soon, the iPod actually got dramatically smaller. And here's what I mean. This became the new mainstream iPod. This is the iPod Nano, and it replaced the iPod Mini. The big difference really was the move from an internal hard drive to flash storage. You did see a loss of capacity in the process of doing so. This is a four gig unit, but they also came in one and two gigabyte models. However, look at the size difference between these two. This is inherently way more pocketable. And frankly, a lot of people then still didn't have that much music or they were a little more willing to frequently swap what music was on their iPod. So offering a lower cost option like one of these that had the benefits of flash storage was a big deal to some people. The hard drives in classic iPods has always really been their Achilles heel. Some people think it's the battery, but for the most part, the hard drive is actually what failed on all of these the most, even back when they were new. And I remember actually going through a few iPods replaced under warranty just because of how delicate the small internal hard drives on these were. Flash storage was expensive in the early 2000s, so going with a mechanical hard drive was really the best way to get decent amounts of capacity without having the price be just way too high for most people to afford. But later in the 2000s, flash prices started coming down. You still didn't get a ton of storage. I mean, trying to get 80 gig of flash storage into something like this, it would have been just absurdly expensive. But it marked a major change for the iPods. So that's the first generation Nano. They came in both black and white, multiple capacities. From there, they did just a slight redesign. They basically took kind of what's more like the iPod mini design language with the all aluminum enclosure around the front and back, all glued together, unfortunately. Functionally, these really weren't much different. These all had color screens, but they, they were meant to mostly just be music playing devices. The next gen, the third gen, is where things got a little bit different and Apple started to experiment. A widescreen display, these were able to play video and they also came in, of course, different capacities. This one was four gigabytes. I believe there was also an eight gigabyte model, multiple colors as well. First gen, just black and white. The second gen, I've got a silver one, but these came in kind of the same range of different colors like the iPod mini did. And going forward, the iPod Nanos all came in multiple colors. I don't have all of them, unfortunately. I don't have like a complete iPod collection, but I've got one of pretty much every model, so we can see the lineage here. People kind of made fun of this design. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure why. People call it like the Fat Boy Nano probably just because it was such a different form factor. The click wheel did get a little bit smaller and some people found that kind of uncomfortable. It didn't like, you couldn't really hold it in your hand quite as comfortably as some of the other ones because it's positioned down towards the bottom and whatnot. I actually kind of like this design, um, but you know, it's just me. The next one that they released kind of went back due to, I think like consumer feedback to that more portrait style. The big difference though was they basically took the screen and rotated it. So not only is the entire enclosure kind of portrait orientation, but the display is as well. The idea is if you watch video, you just turn it like this. I don't know practically if people like that or not. I didn't, again, I didn't really get too much into watching video on iPods during that time. I'm sure some people did. And this might've been a decent compromise to get that a little bit you know, more comfortable form factor to hold, but still maintain the larger display. 
the fifth gen nano was really just an iteration on the fourth slightly taller screen they move the click wheel down just a little bit new colors this one has kind of a more glossy finish on it instead of being just the the anodized of the aluminum the big thing though is this one added a camera i'm not sure how common that got used because the quality was kind of potato as you could imagine you know mid 2000s but it was really just an iterative approach and i don't think these were particularly big sellers at the time. After this, however, Apple got really different with the iPod Nanos. Check this out. Yeah, it's a touchscreen model. And what's more, it's got a clip on the back. So Apple just basically rewrote what the form factor for a small pocketable iPod should be and design this little thing. It's got the same dock connector on the bottom. It's got a headphone jack and it's got multi-touch. Now this does not run iOS. You can't load apps on this like you could an iPhone or an iPod touch at the time. This is still running kind of the semi-proprietary iPod operating system that Apple licensed from a company called Portal Player. But it's got this just really innovative design. Physical volume up-down buttons, like a sleep-wake kind of switch. You may have noticed that there was a watch face. Some people actually got straps. And I don't have one, unfortunately, but they got straps that you could use this as a watch. So some people actually kind of consider this like the OG Apple Watch. It doesn't do anything practically beyond just being a watch in this form factor, right? Like there was no wireless audio built into this. It didn't really do apps other than if you noticed from, from the home screen, you know, you've got a radio, you've got the music options. There's Nike Plus Fitness. This is really more just kind of like a pedometer type of thing. And that's a whole nother video to kind of explain what was going on with that collaboration. Other than just being a watch, uh, there wasn't a whole lot else that this thing could do. If you wanted to strap it to your wrist, I mean, you know, to plug headphones in, you know, when it's on your wrist, that just, nah, that doesn't really work so well. But it's, it's a novel idea. And you can tell that Apple kind of got some ideas from people doing that with the introduction of the Apple Watch. Where Apple went next with the iPod Nano line really kind of righted all the wrongs of that sixth gen. The seventh gen was a very compelling option, in my opinion. It brought back the portrait display style much larger. It actually kind of resembles an iPod Touch, right? But again, it's not running iOS. You can't install really your own apps on here or anything. There's no internet connectivity. However, it brought back some other features and I feel just provided a much better user experience. Videos are back because now you've got a screen large enough to play them and just like some of the prior models The idea was when you're watching video you can just turn the whole thing sideways It's got a dedicated home button so you can see they're really kind of priming people to maybe upgrade into an iPod touch or iPhone a little bit later on from here What I really like about this model They increase the capacities on these so this is a 16 gigabyte version and yeah, I mean, that's not a lot if you're expecting to throw lossless music on here, but considering most people were still just rocking MP3s or AAC compressed files, that's still a decent amount of music that you could store. It came in a variety of colors, but it's just very compact. It's very easy to handle, to slip in a pocket. What I also like about this model is it was the first iPod Nano, really only iPod Nano, to switch to Lightning for synchronizing and charging. It still has a headphone jack as well. Plus, this little plastic cover on the bottom is for an antenna. This is the first and only iPod Nano to include Bluetooth for headphones. It's There's this philosophy I have about analysis paralysis, they call it, where sometimes if you have too much choice, you can't make a decision and that's something that i think a smaller capacity device like an ipod nano can really help some people with like if you've got 
a big iPod with a big hard drive and you've got your entire music library on there, unless there's something you know specifically you want to listen to at that moment in time, sometimes you find yourself just kind of scrolling endlessly, trying to decide what you want to listen to. There's too much choice. What's nice about the Nanos is just by default, because they don't have that much capacity, you've got much more limited choice. So it's easier just to come to a decision as to what you want to listen to. I think the 16 gigabyte capacity is a really sweet spot for avoiding that sort of problem. And with a really nicely handling device like this, I think it just, it's fairly frictionless to want to take something like this and load it up with some music and just listen to it instead of having to deal with, you know, all the modern trappings of dealing with a smartphone and streaming music and all of that kind of stuff, you know, like you want to pull your phone out of your pocket to, you know, just change what music you're listening to, but then you get distracted. No, I want to go check social media. I want to go do this. Oh, I got an email. Oh, I got a text message. You know, it's just, you're constantly getting bombarded with information if you're using a smartphone. That's, I think, the big appeal behind going with a classic iPod for a lot of people is it's distraction-free listening. You may have noticed that I didn't show most of these turned on and working. I would have loved to have given you a demo of, say, the camera or, you know, what video looks like on the third gen or anything like that. I can't bring myself to plug any of these first five models in to charge. And there's a very good reason why. These are very thin, small devices. Apple was really kind of pushing the envelope in terms of what they could pack for technology into as small of a device as possible. Obviously they use lithium ion batteries because that gives you the best size to performance ratio. Unfortunately, with the design of these, in order to pack all that technology in, Apple had to do something, well, that came back to bite a lot of owners these days. They put the battery behind the display. Now, back then, that was really no big deal. But as we know, over time, when lithium ion and lithium polymer batteries fail, well, they start to swell up and leak. Well, <laughs> So what I've found just through personal experience is that that process often gets accelerated if you charge a battery that hasn't been charged in a long time. With that battery being behind the screen physically, you can kind of guess where this is going. If charging it kind of kickstarts that battery swelling process, and I'm not saying this happens every single time, but in my experience, this has kind of been the case. Well, you end up with this. The battery swells, presses against the display, and destroys it. This iPod is one that I actually charged to try and show you what it looks like. And when it charged, that battery swelled up and broke the screen. What sucks about the iPod Nano is that the majority of the models are an absolute nightmare to take apart and replace the batteries in. So even if it hasn't happened to yours yet, it's probably going to, and it's also probably not worth trying to even proactively replace the battery because doing so, you're going to do damage to the iPod. You have to pry the plastic pieces off the top and bottom. There are clips involved. There's lots of internal components that have to come out and go back in in specific orders. I've seen videos of people doing the repairs on these iPods and the vast majority of the time, they end up with at least some level of cosmetic damage, if not just destroying the iPod in the process. So, with that said, it is entirely possible to repair these. If you are an expert in doing very fine work with electronic restorations and component level things, you could probably pull it off. But the average person who even just has moderate experience with electronics, including myself, it's probably not worth doing. There's just too much risk, even though the parts actually are available. The last two models, the 6th and 7th gen, are really the only iPod Nanos that I could recommend at this point. They probably will eventually succumb to the same fate, just because of their design, right? They are 
practically all screen designs. However, these two models are new enough that I think the threat of inflating batteries, swelling batteries, is still fairly low at this point. Otherwise, if you just want to start a collection, show off, you know, what the different lineage of the, the iPod line looks like, these can be had for very cheap online. I just, I would find it difficult to pick one of these up to use. And case in point, this isn't the only iPod that I've seen experience this problem. This is my wife's own iPod Nano from back in the day. We both got them at the same time. Do you see that pressure mark on the screen in the middle? Yep, this one's battery is starting to inflate as well. If I were to plug this one in and charge it up, it would instantly break the screen. Sad to say, that's just what happens with this particular series. Now things weren't quite over with the main iPod line with the fifth gen. The Nano sold tons, and over time, sales of these hard drive-based classic, so-called classic iPods did decrease because the Nanos, they were more convenient, they were cheaper, of course, they were more flashy, different colors and that sort of thing. But Apple had one final update for the classic lineup, and this is actually what's officially called the iPod Classic. Everything prior that's kind of a mainstream hard drive-based iPod prior to these has been kind of retconned as being called the iPod Classic series, but officially speaking, only this sixth gen iPod was really the iPod Classic. Functionality wise, there's hardly any difference between the fifth and sixth gens. They did change the interface a little bit. You can see they went to this kind of split display type of thing where it cycles through like the album artwork. Of course, it plays videos and you can build playlists on the go and that sort of thing. The big difference really is just the slight UI tweaks, some capacities that were available in the hard drive space, and then also the physical design. They appear very similar and this 6th gen was also available in black. So we went to a silver and black option instead of just white and black. Unfortunately, I don't have a white 5th gen. However, these are very different when it comes to repair. The fifth gens, these are actually good. They're, they're good for repair. They're not too terrible to take apart because they've got the polycarbonate front and the chrome back and the clips aren't quite a pain to, uh, to take apart. The sixth gen, people hate these to repair <laughs> because the front panel is actually aluminum. So the clips are a lot stiffer between the front panel and that chrome back. And especially on the thinner versions of these, because the thickness of the back really differed depending on the capacity of the iPod. This is an 80 gig unit. This guy is 160 gig, and you can see the 160 gig model is thicker. The thicker ones seem to be a little bit easier to take apart because there's a bit more flex you can get in the back, but even still, I mean, like, dude, go watch DankPod's early videos about doing upgrades and repairs on iPods. That's kind of how his channel got its start. He will just swear endlessly about working on these models. He doesn't want to do it anymore, and I don't blame him. These were really the end of the line for the hard drive-based iPods. And Apple, to its credit, kept these around until 2014. There was a small but vocal minority of people who wanted like really big hard drives in their iPod where they can store the entirety or a lot of their music collection with them on the go. And so long past when these had any sort of mainstream appeal, Apple did continue to sell them. But they did have to stop in 2014, not necessarily entirely because they just, you know, the sales were too low, but Apple's cited reason was they couldn't get the parts anymore. The mechanical hard drives in these, Toshiba, I believe, was the manufacturer of them. They just stopped making them. Apparently, Apple was like their last customer that were buying large capacity 1.8 inch hard drives, and it just wasn't worth their time to keep making the drives. So they stopped manufacturing them. Apple ran out of parts in the supply chain and had to discontinue this model. Some people really like this because of that UI, that sort of thing, but 
If you have to get in and replace a battery or replace the hard drive or do any sort of upgrades, which we'll talk about, well, yeah, sad to say these sixth gen models are a lot more frustrating to work on. There was one more iPod lineup that ran kind of concurrently with the iPod mini and nano, and it served an even more niche purpose. This was just the most entry level thing that you could get into anything that said iPod on it. Some people bought it as their only music player. Some people bought it as an additional music player alongside another iPod. But the iPod shuffle was a really interesting concept. The whole idea is that it was a music player with no screen. None of the iPod shuffle models had a screen on them. All you could do was basically just skip forward and back. And like its name suggested, the idea was that you would load up a bunch of songs on there and just set the thing to shuffle mode and listen to whatever it decided to serve up. Unfortunately, I don't have the very first gen iPod shuffle. I'm still looking for one. I did have one back when they were new, however, and they were really kind of neat. I like the idea of just having this very small, simple iPod that you could throw in your pocket. It was solid state storage. It had excellent battery life. That first gen unfortunately suffered from a problem that a lot of them did, and that is, well, the batteries failed, and because the whole thing was glued closed, it wasn't really easy to replace it yourself. They were pretty much disposable devices, like the rest of the, 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 whole, the whole iPod Nano series, really. The upside was they were fairly cheap, right about a hundred bucks or so is what you would end up paying for one, if not a bit less. The first gen shuffles came in 512 megabyte and one gigabyte capacities. And they came with this kind of neat lanyard that you could clip to it as well. It got a little messy with the headphone cable because there was no, you know, Bluetooth headphones that it could sync with back then. But it was, it was something that got people talking. The second gen shuffle, however, now this, this is when the iPod Shuffle actually really started to become useful. And you can see where I was talking about with the iPod Nano, the sixth gen that had the clip on the back. Well, this is where that got its idea from. The whole point was forget the lanyard, forget sticking it in your pocket, just plug for your headphones into the top and clip it to your shirt or your jacket. All you get for controls is simply basically a power on off and then shuffle or no shuffle <laughs> on the bottom, and then play pause, volume up, down, and then skip track back and forward. Of course, you could load an entire album on here and listen to it all the way through if you wanted. The thing is, if you had more than one album's worth of music, you would have to skip through the entire album to get to the next one, that sort of thing, right? Because there's no screen. So you could use this as a primary music player if you really wanted to, but using it for shuffle mode made a lot more sense. I absolutely love the iPod Shuffle, and I still use one to this day, mostly just because of how small and light and convenient it is. These have incredible battery life on them. Even though they were kind of disposable in design, I mean, you just get dozens and dozens of hours simply because they're all solid state and there's no screen. All of the power hungry components from the other iPods are pretty much gone. So it can be small and still offer fantastic battery life. Something kind of interesting about like the second gen shuffle that it started with was, well, how do you charge and sync it, right? Like there's no USB port, there's no dock connector. This is before the days of lightning. Well. <laughs> Apple did something rather clever and they made the headphone jack dual purpose. Along with the second gen shuffles, you got a little docking station that had a USB cable coming out of it. And so the shuffle would recognize when it was in the dock and use the headphone jack for charging and data transfer instead. Kind of a wild idea but it actually worked really well and it allowed them to dramatically shrink the size of the player. You can tell I've got a blue one here. They came in a variety of colors as well. And I believe the second gen came in one and two gigabyte capacities, if I remember correctly. And as useful as this design was, it lasted for a while, but Apple couldn't help but tinker with the formula a bit and ended up producing probably the biggest flop of the entire iPod series with the third gen shuffle. 
I remember when they announced this and it was all about, look how small it is, look how light it is, look how tiny it is, it takes up no space at all. Literally the only control on the entire thing is just a single switch that goes between on and off and playthrough mode and shuffle mode. This thing absolutely bombed in the marketplace because the only way to control it for volume, for play pause, for track skip was through the headphone jack. You had to use the inline remote that came with the headphones packaged with this thing in order to control it. Yes, there were some third parties that made adapters that allowed you to plug in your own headphones, but just off the bat to be forced to use the built-in earbuds, which admittedly didn't sound all that great, put a lot of people off. This thing only lasted about a year on the market before Apple realized that it had screwed up in major fashion and ended up righting all the wrongs with the fourth gen. They went back to the clip. This is one of rare occasion of Apple admitting that they had made a mistake and putting things back the way they were when people liked them. Physically, this thing is a bit smaller than the second gen. You can see they managed to kind of shrink the size down on the one side. It's about the same thickness. They made the clip a little bit more slimline. However, this thing made a lot of people happy when they came out with it. And this model had several years of life to it. These were around for a very long time. I think they only came in two gigabyte capacities. They periodically changed the, the color selection for them over time. But functionality wise, this was more or less the same as the second gen, just in a slightly smaller package. I mentioned that I still use one of these every day. A lot of people, especially like when we even got into the smartphone era, a lot of people still stuck to using these for exercise simply because they are damn near indestructible. I've gone out and run with one of these every single day for years. I've gotten stuck in thunderstorms. I've gotten absolutely drenched. This thing has gotten soaked. I think I might have even run this thing through the washing machine once or twice. It just keeps working. The battery life is incredible. I don't have to charge this thing very often at all, maybe once a month, and that's using it for like 30 to 45 minutes every day. It's fantastic for music. It's also fantastic for audiobooks, which is primarily what I use it for when I exercise. But lots of people ended up loving these. The gym rats, the runners like myself, just anyone who's going out and being active. It's so small and so light and just so unobtrusive. You just clip it to your shirt or your waistband or whatever. You can plug in whatever headphones you want. There's controls on it. They work great. Sadly, these were discontinued in 2017 and a lot of people freaked out when they were, including myself, to the point where, well, I um, immediately rushed out and bought a couple spares. <laughs> So there's more than a few of us who are hoarding a couple of brand new in-box last-gen iPod shuffles just in case. Because again, these really aren't repairable. Like when the battery in this one finally dies, and I've been using this model for, not kidding, five plus years every day. It still works great. Of course, I jinxed it by saying that. But when that battery finally dies, at least I've got a couple more. Yes, I realize eventually these will die as well and I'll be totally screwed, but you know, it is what it is and at least I've got backups for now. Apple did get rid of that novel USB dock with these, but they still synchronize over the headphone jack. You just got this little itty bitty cable instead, which to some people is super annoying and to other people it's actually quite convenient. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's how they were able to get the packaging down this small. And this includes headphones, too. You get a pair of earbuds in here as well. They're just tiny little packaging. I think the price for these at the very end retail was like 70 bucks or 80 bucks. They were the, the price actually kind of came down over time. And, you know, it used to be you would drop 100 bucks or so on an iPod shuffle. And the value in 2017 when these were discontinued was still actually very good. So... If you just want something for basic music playback and you don't care about tons of capacity, you don't even care about a screen, you just want something you can load an audiobook on and go out for a walk, 
go pick up one of these last gen shuffles. You will have very good success with one of these. So all that said, if you're interested in getting into the iPod ecosystem, you want just something that'll play music, you don't want to get distracted by your phone, you want to just load music from your computer onto a dedicated music playing device. And yes, there actually are more people out there who want something like that than you may realize. Well, there are some clear winners from the iPod family, some clear losers, and then there are some that are kind of in the middle that are workable if you're willing to put in some effort. I should also note, all of these iPods are still capable of being used on modern computers. I did a video about that. One thing that I have learned since I produced that video is that on Windows, there's actually two different versions of iTunes, at least at the time I'm filming this. There's the version that's on the Windows Store, and then there's the separate executable installer you can get directly from Apple. If you get the version from the Windows Store, it doesn't have the built-in drivers to support these classic iPods. Only things that run iOS, basically. However, if you get the executable installer from Apple, you are able to get those drivers. So all of these can be synchronized to either modern Macs or Windows computers without too much shenanigans, other than the fact that you need to do iTunes to use it. I'm not gonna get into the topic of third-party software for managing these or third-party firmware that you can flash onto iPods. There's way too much to go into for how long this video has gone on for, but just know there aren't any crazy hoops you have to jump through in order to get these working with the computer you have right now. Okay, all that said, specific models that I would recommend. If you just want to play music and you don't have a huge library, I would go with a fourth gen. The reason why is there were a ton of these that were sold back when they were new. So that means there's a ton of them on places like eBay and Facebook Marketplace, garage sales, thrift shops, what have you. The more of them that are available, the lower the prices are going to be and also the better parts support that you can get. You can't buy parts from these from Apple, of course, you can buy hardly any parts from Apple, but there is a pretty robust ecosystem of third party parts that are available for these. They don't manufacture the hard drives so much anymore. However, there is really a cottage industry that's kind of popped up of like enthusiasts for iPods who have come up with adapters where you can replace the mechanical hard drive in something like this with flash storage, either a compact flash card or SD card, that sort of thing. There are some limits as to how large of cards you can use based on the model of iPod, but you can buy third party batteries and other parts like if the screen is bad or cracked or the click wheel goes bad. I mean, just because of how many of these were sold, there's a very robust replacement parts ecosystem. The fourth gen is not just cheap to get into, but it's relatively easy to repair with lots of parts availability. The only limitation, of course, is that it's a black and white screen and it pretty much just only plays audio files. If you want something that's natively flash storage, even smaller, just super pocketable and just easy to take with you, by far seventh gen iPod Nano. I never had one of these when they were new. I picked this one up only relatively recently. I absolutely love it. I love this thing way more than I was expecting that I would. The touchscreen works really well. It's a decent size screen. I wouldn't bother watching video on one of these. That's just gonna be way too cumbersome of a process. But 16 gigabytes of storage, like we were talking about with analysis paralysis and all that, is just a really decent amount. And I love the fact that it uses lightning which makes it really convenient to charge and sync data with, especially if you already have an iPhone or iPad. You know, it's just, it's just so convenient. It's, even though it's years old and hasn't been sold for a long time, it still feels fairly modern. They came in a variety of really cool colors. I actually kind of like the fact that this one's the salmon color. It's not normally a color that I would pick. It's just what happened to fall into my lap, but I, I kind of like it. The Bluetooth built in, is another just killer feature for this sort of thing. And they're new enough that I wouldn't really worry about the whole battery expanding situation for at least a few more years. 
So the best pick for something that's got decent capacity, but a screen and as small as you can get, 7th Gen Nano by far. As for models that could be pretty neat to get into, but are gonna take a little bit of work and or have some caveats, well, the obvious answer is gonna be the first and second gens. These actually still have decent parts availability. You can buy new batteries, you can buy replacement drives in some cases, you can flash mod these if you want. The limiting factor really is Firewire. That's not an insurmountable problem. You can get adapters. If you've got a modern computer, you can get Firewire cards still to throw in there. You know, if you're on a Mac or a laptop, there's this crazy chain of adapters you can get to go from Thunderbolt to Firewire to the right connector to get in, you know, the cable to get into the top. And I've actually done that in previous episodes, but they're pretty much all going to have some sort of problem at this point. Um, just because of their age. These are 20 years old. The battery is pretty much going to be shot. A lot of these are going to suffer from dead hard drives or dying hard drives. So the chances of finding one of these that's just good to go as a used unit that no one has refurbished or fixed up ahead of time, it's pretty low. You're pretty much guaranteed to have to put some work into one of these to get it working reliably as like a daily driver, if you will. That said, they're not impossible to take apart because it's the two-piece design. You can pry the back off. I've actually had the back off of this one before, and it's really not any worse for wear. The prices on these also, just as units, is a bit higher just because of the collector value. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Buying one of these just because it's 20 years old doesn't mean it's going to be the cheapest option. It's, it's iconic. So people are going to want these, if anything else, just as shelf candy. There's no telling exactly where this is going to go because there's really not that many high quality portable, just dedicated music players anymore. And what does remain seems to be going after, say, the audiophile kind of crowd with things like high res audio. And a lot of them are really just running Android under the hood anyway. So if you want a no frills, distraction free kind of experience to a lot of people, the iPod really is kind of it. So we'll see where this all has to go, but I can tell you there's a lot of choice and a lot of different niches that can be filled based on what you're looking for. All you gotta do is just pick out the color, the capacity, and which one is right for you. If you like the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, Thanks for watching.